of things I do after this dope is dry is I reseed all the hinges. This way it lets a little bit of dope in the fuel proof it. I don't know if you can see. Even though we silk spanned right over this, just finding where these holes are, shoving the hinges back down there. You don't want to wait until they have this thing in silver before you put those hinge pockets back in. And of course we'll do the same thing to the elevator. Now this already has one coat of glitter already dried out. I'm just using this nice light dust from the bar. See it keeps on. There's no big intense thing here. Put all the radiators back on everything. Now obviously on the curved edges out here. You want to, you don't want to use a block on these curves. You get the paper folds up and you get a nice point. Get in behind a horn here. Again, be careful on the inside not to take too much meat, meat off. We know we have the dotted lines here, so we don't have, we don't get this all thin in the middle where we got extra glass. You can see where the extra glass is and the, ex the extra tissue goes out to here, from here to here. That's the double tissue. You can see it coming through. Of course, you got to find a way of holding these guys, these guys while they're drying. Let's see how that works. Oh, man, that worked pretty good. Okay, we're putting on a second coat of nitrate now. And while you still have these little fuzzes and hairs up here, you can kind of brush them down, mat them down if you can. Just push down a little on a brush as you paint and try not to get any runs or big drools. We want to get that hinge line nice because once we get the flaps on permanently in the elevators, it's hard to get in there. I always try to get a little bit of extra in the center because I know I'm going to be block sanding that down. And maybe if you just see on a video and just see how many coats are involved in this, even though you can read about this stuff in a magazine, reading only goes so far. Seeing it in real life, I think, is worth a thousand words. And there's certainly a lot of good finishers that have a lot of good techniques. This is just my technique. And you can go uh, with a lot of experimental kind of finishes, but... Uh, 
I think the best finish overall is still nitrate dope up to the silver, SIG silver, and then either acrylic lacquer or butyrate dope with a little extra pigment and take it from there. Clear of your choice. Acrylic lacquer usually works out good. SIG dope works out good. Imran will be good but it'll probably be heavy. I haven't had good luck with hobby epoxy. It always seems to look like uh, not a buffed out lacquer finish anyway, that deep glow, so I'm not crazy about hobby epoxy. Although a lot of people like Ted Fancher seem to make it work real nice. It's hard to keep getting a grip on this hand in the neck. Now, so many people that have watched the Nobler video have commented that they enjoyed the finishing part the most. And they just had never seen how a, a finish in first hand seen it being applied. That I'm probably going to spend a lot of extra time on the finishing end of this. So maybe you'll be bored watching it all. I don't know. Maybe you'll learn something. I guess we'll find out. And to all the people that called me up and said they liked the Nobler video, well, appreciate the good comments. And I hope you get something out of this guy, too. And if your building gets better and your finishing gets better, well then, heck, it was worth me taking all this time. And Kenny doing his thing. I don't think Kenny's getting rich doing his videos, that's for sure. And I know I'm not. Alright, so, we're going to let this dry overnight. Get another look at it. Tomorrow we'll come down, that should be ready for one more coat, and then we'll start mixing up some talc and fill it. A little tip, this is a handy way to keep your paint in here. Just cut a little hole, the, the diameter of the top of the brush. Now see that brush, I can leave it sticking in the paint or sticking down. Best thing is don't let the bottom of the the bottom of the brush touch the bottom of the can then it that just bows out and you get a slimy brush if you just leave it so that the the tip of the hairs is sticking in the dope it's a nice little tip it'll save you a lot of aggravation we just include that in on a video no extra charge boot and sink Now we'll start putting the talc on. And what I'm starting to do, if you start looking at this, you can start almost candling it and shining light off it. And that's about the time it's ready to put a coat of filler on. Now because I'm trying to keep the tail really light, this will really try to keep the finish more metal now here. When we get to the wing, we'll put a little more finish on. I'm going to try to do this in one more coat, and then it'll be it. Try to knock all the edges down, radius all the edges again. Constantly radius the edge. That's the best way to get this. Every edge. Everywhere there's a corner, try to break the corner down. And when you go to buff the plane out, you're not going to run into a, a situation where you're going to have some edges sticking through. little hinge sliding tool we used before, that's good for get right into those slots. See if you can see this on a Get all these edges knocked down nice. And then this will be ready for probably the last coat of clear before we do the filler. 
I like to knock down each coat. Some people like to put on three coats and then knock it down. Once you start to see a little bit of a shine, a hint that you can reflect light, I don't know if you can see this, it'll just start to reflect light now. Then you know you're ready for a one more thin coat on it. In fact, on this coat, before we put this coat on, we'll put just a few more drops of thinner in there because that makes a nice wreath that we have. So that the last coat will have a little less of the brush strokes in it. Make sure you don't have any rough edges and where the joints are where we put that extra coat. Should be nice and smooth by now. This should start to feel like a baby's ass. And start to have a little bit of a shine at this point in time. I don't know if you can see that shine on there. And should start to feel really nice and smooth. Then put a, yeah, one more coat will do it, I think. Just doing edges like this. This will just help you get the edges nice. Of course, another way to do it is take some spray 3M cement and glue this right to the table if you like. That's a legitimate way to do it. This will help you keep the edges all nice and smooth. Candling, and if you see, you're picking up little balls on the sandpaper. It looks like little balls of chewing gum. You know you're sanding too soon. You should let the dope dry out a little more. Now, I haven't picked up any yet today, but I probably will as I get into this. What you want to try to do then is let the dope dry out a little more, or the next time you put a coat on, put it on with a little more thinner. We might have put this on on the thick side. Although I haven't got any roly polies coming up there yet. Uh, here, I don't know if you can see this, there's little, what amounts to be little balls. Now I rub it on the end of the glass, get, this, get them off the sandpaper because they're going to put little ridges in as you sand. Because you do want to try to get through. Just keep cleaning the sandpaper. Keep looking at it, make sure you're not picking up any of them little balls of chewing gum. Those are little indentations that you'll have to fill in later on in the finish. And 
obviously when you get down to these round edges, then you want to just do it by hand and be real careful with these curved edges. When the dope powder's off like this, then you know it's just about right. And you'll notice the nitrate does sand kind of nice. The light coat, if you're using a light coat, is a little bit more difficult to sand. This kind of powder's off a little nicer. But we will put a little more thinner in the next coat, just to make sure. I think we do have this on a, a little bit on the heavy side, but not by much, probably about 10%. When you see it powdering off like this, you know you got it just about right. Now, there's no talc in this yet. This is strictly nitrate. Now, it's important, and I wanted to show this on a video, not only to sand by hand, because that's going to take off some of the spots, but you still have to block sand out to get out those real mountain tops. Especially where the silk span ends here. We got kind of a ridge that'll come out. Keep cleaning off the sandpaper by rubbing it on the edge of the glass. And to get around the filler here, I want a perfect blend from one to the other. Best way to do this is with a block. But you still have to sand both ways with a block. And of course the edges come down good with a block. You can get in all the corners. You can't just sand by hand and you can't just sand with a block. You have to do about equal amounts of both to get what we're trying to accomplish. Don't know if you can see, there's just starting to be a shine on this part. And of course in the front here, I'm going to be real careful not to take all the, all the glass out of the middle here when I sand around this. I'm going to be real careful to get a nice blend into the filler. These are the little details that uh, hopefully if the appearance judging is done right at the NAS, it should separate the top couple planes. But, uh, you know, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you just, the judges don't have the time to look at the detail work. But if you walk around, you look at any of the top airplanes, and you'll see little touches and little things on there that just aren't on other planes. One of them is that blend from the elevator to the filler, the blend into the wingtips. Looking to see if the wing tips and the stab tips and the rotor tip all kind of match. You don't have some mismatch of a plane that looks like it's made from four different planes where you put Edsel fenders on Fords and Ford hubcaps on Chevys. The plane kind of has a, uh, a matched look. Some of the ships you see, they have rounded wing tips and square stabs and pointed rudders. and it, They're just kind of a mismatch, I guess. One of the planes that I always really liked is uh, the styling of Billy Wurlich's planes. They kind of match. The tails match the rudders, which match the wing tips. Everything kind of matches. You don't have this mismatch look. It looks like you took a tail out of a barnstormer and a wing out of a nobler. And one's square and one's round and one's pointy and one's curved. And I try to avoid that, but needless to say, all of that is in the eye of the beholder. So. Just remember, you got to do some sanding with a block, and you got to do the same amount of sanding. I'd say it's 50 50 by hand. The block gets out all the mountaintops, and your hand gets the valleys low. Now, I like to rub my hand around and see, just look around for soft spots, spots that need some more. I 
I always try to get the leading edge of the stab real nice. That's one of the parts that as a guy is launching your plane, he can feel. And if you have a point there, it seems like the paint wears out from launching the plane pretty easily. I've had planes where the paint just wears out right on the edge of the, right edge of the stab. And if you keep candling it, you'll keep seeing low spots. Now, I just did one right here. shouldn't be intimidated by any of this finishing stuff. This is really just, just redundant labor. Once you get a little technique and a feel for it, it's just, it's just a question of sanding, putting it on, taking it off, putting it on, taking it off. to this paint before we put on the last, what's going to be, I hope, the last coat if we can get this to look good. Jeez. Embarrassing. A man can't open a can of vinegar. Nacho. indications from sanding this out that I didn't have enough thinner in the paint, so this coat will be a little on the thin side. She leave a lot less brush marks, too.
obviously try to keep the brush strokes to a minimum. Goes without saying. One of the biggest mistakes in doing this is trying to pile on a bunch of dope in one day, say, or in a very short time. You really have to let each coat of dope dry overnight. You just can't seem to rush it. Now, a lot of guys try to force dry it by turning the heat up in the house, and that'll work a little bit. But the best way is just let each coat of dope dry overnight. Never put two coats on in one day. And if you're going to sand it, wait in two days will make sanding it a lot easier. There's no realistic way to, to rush a dope finish. Not that I know of. You can see we're starting to get a little shine on this now. up our talc filler. One third uh, thinner, one third talc, one third nitrate. I just got back from dinner so all I'm going to do is put a coat on this, let it dry overnight, come back in the morning and sand it out. This already has one coat of filler on it, this is actually the second coat. around the edges so I can radius the edges and I put a little extra thinner in this coat. The first coat I put on pretty thick. This coat has a little bit a little bit extra thinner. Now notice I'm not digging down into the bottom of the pan and dig, digging up all that extra talc now. Just trying to keep this nice and smooth so the sanding will be a minimum. Some of this obviously has to be sanded with a foam block, and this is a good time to do it. Corners radius. This is probably going to be the last coat of silver, last coat of filler before we put the silver on. And you can see now that this is dry overnight, this is really dusting off like beautiful. Keep using that hinge sliding tool to get those little hinge pockets nice and nice and smooth. Keep a nice corner on everything. Notice how nice that nitrate sands right off. Finish everything up with 400 and I think this guy's going to be ready for the old coat of silver trick. It's not a really good day to spray. It's raining outside. 
So we may wait a day or so to see if we get a little bit better temperature and humidity condition to spray the Sig Silver. Now that Sig Silver is butyrate. Once we hit this with butyrate, we can't go back and put any more nitrate on it. I don't know if you can see, we got a little bit of a, let's see if we can see this, a little bit of a, a shine on this if you can, a little bit of a smooth. This is where it's handy to have the table all padded up. I got three or four blankets and foam rubber and everything on here. It may seem like a lot of this is redundant. I'm just showing on the video sanding, doping, sanding, doping, and everything. It's just a lot of redundancy. But a lot of people, and you may, be, may or may not be one of them, have no idea just what goes into this amount of finish. And doing parts of the finish before you actually absorb, assemble a plane and have to work on the plane as a whole unit is a way that I found my, in my own house, because I'm working in small conditions here. The shop is really tiny of uh, just keeping the nicks and dings down to a minimum. Obviously, you could do the whole plane and, and then finish it all in one unit, but this is a way that I've found to work good for me. And uh, not everybody does it this way, of course. Other people uh, have found other ways, including finishing the whole plane at once or using epoxy paint. But this way has worked real good for me. And it's relatively easy. I can sit here and sand the tail a lot easier than I can when I have the whole plane banging into walls and in this shop, it hits the ceiling and everything in your belt buckle and rings and jewelry and everything. And what I've tried to show is just how much sanding and how much doping, how much filling and everything, so you can get a gauge on just how much material is on an airplane. If you finish an airframe after it's all in one piece, you should be looking at between 7 and 10 ounces, 7 ounces being the minimum for a real nice finish, 10 ounces being the upper end of that envelope. And something in between certainly should get you to concourse or what if you spend your time sanding out the corners and doing all the detail work. My guess is right now we'll be able to, you got a little bit of a shine on this. I don't know if you can see this on the, the final tape. I've got almost all the filler off. And we're about ready for the old uh, Lakota Silva. And this should be ready to go. I'm doing now is just putting a final finish on this with some brand new 400. Always catch the edges. Those edges, if you don't get a nice radius on them, what's going to happen, as soon as you put the colored paint or the silver on there, you'll sand right through the edge and you'll have a, an eyesore sticking up looking at you. I see I got a little edge here I have to catch with a block joint. I 
And even though this will be on the bottom of the airplane, and I'm sure nobody will ever see this, we want to get it right. Just in case Ski Dombrowski's working or Joe Reinhardt or Stan Powell or somebody. They can't go, ah, there he is, he screwed up. <laughs> well, now you know I screwed up. You know I'm covering it up. All the sanding is done now. We've got a real good base on here. I'm going to get ready. I'm going to mix up the filler, the uh, silver. The filler is finished. And then we'll probably have to sand off one or two coats of silver. This way we know we got the absolute bare minimum amount of paint on a plane. The silver, of course, is going to pick up all the flaws in the paint. These parts are going to look pretty ratty when I get done silvering them. They'll pick up the dry spots, and uh, we'll try to get on camera fixing some dry spots. So you have the absolute minimum paint right on up to the silver. Everything that's on these parts right now is nitrate dope, too. clean as we possibly can. I vacuumed up most of the shop. Don't get a lot of dust in the paint. Be ready to start mixing paint soon. Now we're mixing up the SIG silver. We're using SIG butyrate silver. Mix with 3608S thinner. Mix this up in an old jar. I'm going to use some fish eye killer, a couple of drops of fish eye killer. I like to add a couple of drops to every batch of paint. A couple of drops of that will save you a lot of work. Dave Brown's Flex Oil is good. If you don't want to buy a giant amount at a body shop, you can buy a little, little amount. A couple of drops of that helps. Using about 75% thinner, just roughly, 75% yeah. thinner, and 25% SIG Silver. When you take that silver out of the can, make sure you shake it and stir it and strain it and everything. You really have to take your time when you do this. It's not a quick thing. You've got to get busy shaking it like you can hear me shaking it now. Believe me, it takes time to shake this stuff up. Not an easy thing. Shake o matic, baby. And about this time of year, I try to get my wife to start saving jars, which she does pretty well. Of course, she eats a lot. That's why we have a lot of jars. Of course, I'm on a diet. I'm completely thin and muscular, so I can criticize everybody. All right, but anyway, having a lot of those jars around is really a big help. That's the fish eye killer, the flex oil, the right thinner to put in the paint, and the SIG Silver. This is silver butyrate. We're going to put the first coat on with the idea that it'll be filler.
cleaning up the gun right now. It's got black in it now for some reason. I don't even remember painting it in black. Anyway, clean the gun out with thinner before we put the SIG Silver in. It's real handy now if you have a gun that you can leave silver in all the time. Well, hell, you'll save a lot of time cleaning and stuff. And these cups are pretty pain in the neck to clean anyway. Anyway, we got all the black out of the gun. We're going to put the silver in. Mark up these cans, what's in them. There are about 200 of these cans laying around the shop. Good idea to mark everything that's in the can, and most of all, mark what kind of thinner you use when you thin the paint. That's why you won't get a big surprise somewhere down the road if you use high gloss thinner and something. Try to keep my hands reasonably clean while I'm touching parts and stuff. Now I know there's people out there that can paint without getting their hands dirty and mix paint and clean things, but I ain't one of them. When I used to do this for a living, I worked in a body shop. My hands looked like like the side of this can all the time. It was a real mess. And you come to bed at night smelling like 3608S. That's always attractive. My wife appreciates that a lot. All right, gun is clean. We got the pressure set at 20 pounds, which is about right for doing our coat of silver. Let's spray a generous amount on the floor here so we have something to do tonight. Cleaning it up. You're probably going to look at this and say, oh my God, look at that old greasy spray gun he's got. Let's get a look at this guy. This is a DeVilbus gun. It's about a $200 gun right now. I had this since uh, about 1955. Hasn't worn out yet. The cheaper models, these are the ones you can buy for about $40. These are fine. They look a lot prettier, but the DeVilbus gun is definitely the best. So if you have the money to invest, it's a good idea. If you're a cheapskate, buy one of them other things and it'll work just as good. And having a lot of money in this hobby really ain't much of an advantage. Not many millionaires go on to be national champion, that's for sure. In fact, probably the one thing they all have in common is they work hard with a very little amount of money. Hey, I gotta, can't emphasize enough to keep shaking that silver when you see the bottom start to disappear and you can start to see clear through all that sediment that silver powder all slips to the bottom and of course it does the same thing in a gun so just keep after it I was shaking a jar of silver like this one day when a friend of mine was here we were painting his plane and he didn't have the lid on tight and I shook it and made him silver looked like the tin man from the Wizard of Oz Probably a lot funnier now than it was from then. All I kept singing through the rest of the day was, We're off to see the wizard! And man, he was the wizard. That shit was everywhere in his hair and his eyes. Lucky he didn't get any really in his eyes. So if you're looking at this video, just remember that funny day, baby, because it was you. I ain't gonna mention the name on video or it'll kill me. But. I have referred to him as the Wizard of Oz from time to time. Okay, we're ready to put this in. This just, just for some reason looks like it's on the thick side. We may have to add a little thinner. We'll find out. Spraying with 20 pounds of pressure is about what we want to do. Now I can usually tell just by looking at it if we're close. You really want to avoid putting a lot of thinner on. You want to get this on relatively dry, but not so dry that you pull up all the paint with the tape. If you're pulling up paint, when you pull the tape up, it probably means you didn't have enough thinner in the paint. And nobody gets to be national champion without doing that a few times, that's for sure. No concourse winners that haven't made that mistake. All right, we're going to go outside out of the shop room now and do some painting.
eventually hear that compressor kick on. So don't think the house is burning down or something. Oh, there it goes. From the looks of this part, it looks looks like it's pretty decent. Looks like we've got just enough base on there. May not even need a set coat. Uh-oh, we got a dry spot right there. I don't know if we're going to be able to see that on the video. A dry spot is something that just looks like, uh-oh, you can see raw wood. And the way we'll fix that is we'll spray on a little bit of clear and another coat of silver. That's the only dry spot on the whole thing. Gee, that's real good. Okay, that's super. We only got one spot to worry about. I'm going to now just set this aside to dry. Figuring out, now there's a lot of ways to hold the parts. You can make all kind of little wire fixtures. You want to be careful if you do this, this little deal like I do with the uh, X-Acto blade and the hinge slot. Don't shove it in so far that this bubbles up. I've done that already. That's going to ruin your whole day too. And of course, now you can breathe in all those nice paint fumes. Pretty cold outside, so I don't want to open the door and let it all air cold in there. You can do this in a heated garage, of course, it's real nice. Keeping the pressure down is one of the tricks of getting a nice smooth coat on. We're spraying with about 20 pounds right now. Relatively thin paint. We're trying to put on the thinnest possible coat of silver and still cover all the dry spots. And we're looking around this guy to see if we, yeah, we got one out in the corner here, a little dry spot. We're just going to have to hit those dry spots with a little bit of light coat later and a little more clear. They'll be fine. this to be as perfect as possible. You want it to look like an aluminum airplane at this point. Just like these parts were made out of aluminum. It's a handy way to hold it right by the horn, in case you're looking for a handy way to hold this guy. Now we're going to put this aside to dry, needless to say. Go outside and get a breath of fresh air before we choke to death down here. And we got the parts out there ready to dry right now. I guess we can start laying out the gear blocks in the wing. While we're waiting for that to dry. That definitely has to dry two days before you sand it or fool around with it again. So we'll let it sit there for two days and get on with the wing. Now before we start working on the wing cores and laying out the gear block location, wiping the table down with acetone, getting off all a little nicks and dings, a little bubbles of hot stuff. Try to get it cleaned up. This is a pretty old piece of glass. 
A lot of planes have been built on this piece of glass, including the Red Baron, the Cardinal. A lot of the BJs and LJs all come off of this piece of glass, so it's taken a beating. Served me well. Also, I want to clean up my hands real good. This is acetone. I don't want to get glock all over those wing cores and those skins while I'm laying out the gear blocks. Now we've laid out the lines. We want the gear to be 22 inches apart. That's our gear spread. So we've drawn a line in the core for that. These wing cores do not have gear blocks in them and they will not have a spar. So we have to kind of lay this out for ourselves. And that's step one, is to get that laid out. I know my gear blocks are going to be two inches long. So I can lay that out also. Now the idea of having a 22 inch gear spread, there's two reasons for it. I want it to have the look of a ship with the landing gear further out in the wing. And also it doesn't weaken the middle of the wing. I want to keep the middle of the wing as strong as possible. Relative to a pattern master, say this is a relatively thin wing for a lot of rakes, so I really want to have that pretty well s solid in the middle. And these are just my lines now. Now I want to plot out the point at which the spar is going to run through this, and I have to get a center line here, a center line here. This is going to allow me to plot out. I'm going on the middle of the foam spar. This will allow me to plot out the location of this. Okay. I'm going off this piece here, going off the center of the spar out here. And then I'll just have to connect the lines over here and that'll be my location. It won't be the location of the blocks, it'll be the location of the little stub, the little front winglets that are going to be made out of light ply that are going to hold the gear blocks in. Now I basically want those landing gear to come straight down on a 90 degree angle. And I know for instance from having built one of these ships before that I'm going to want it to balance about 8 inches in front of the flap hinge line. So this then becomes my, my point of reference for that. Okay, so it's going to balance there. I'm going to want the gear blocks out about uh, An inch in front of that, I guess, would be the normal number, normal amount. I can plot that line right now, too. Okay, we've got that. This then is going to become our. did, using a saw, we saw it down through and put these two notches in, and I'm making up landing gear clips. I was going to use light ply, but I chickened out at the last minute, I'm going to use regular 8 inch plywood. I'm going to have to lay these out individually by shoving plywood down through there, trace out both sides. We've already figured out where our landing gear block was. So now I'll just repeat that operation on this side. OK. 
Okay, make sure we got that fit. We want to sink these blocks just below, just the least little bit below the surface, too. Lock this one in her. What that's doing is laying out the outer one. Get it all lined up and just trace the outside edge. Might want to leave a little bit extra because we're going to grind this sucker down. That, that allocates that little area. Now you have to line up. Well, let's cut this out first. We got to line up and see exactly where our gear block is going to come into this. Okay, so I'll cut this piece out now. Mark the location of where the gear block's going to be. I just make sure you sink this guy down a little bit. doing a little redesign on the inner one because I want to double up the thickness of the landing gear block for the, uh, the part of the leg that sticks through. So I'm going to throw this away, redesign that a little bit here. I'm going to cut that guy out now. And here's the old one. We're going to do away with that one now. This will have the extra cut out for the extra piece of landing gear block. So I want to sink those blocks down into the wing and build that up with balsa. Okay, we got the clips drilled out, sawed out. Just gonna clean them up now, roughen them up with sandpaper, and get them glued in the wing. That'll be the next step. Now, if they stick out a little bit, that's okay because we could drop them down flush after the glue dries with, uh, you know, an old Dremel sanding drum or something. We can get it nice and flush with the wing.
I'm kind of uh, used to make these when I do wingy or make these out of light ply. I'm glad I'm doing these out of real plywood because a lot of this plane's life it'll spend flying on grass at local contests. And these fields that we fly on, Circle Burner Field and Edison and stuff, they're really rough. And nothing more disgusting than tearing the gear out of a plane. Boy, I hate that. So, I'm really glad I made the decision here to go with the 8-inch uh, plywood. So we got all pieces now ready to go into the wing. Got an outer piece, an outer piece, an inner piece, and an inner piece. Now if you had a hot wire around, of course you could hot wire these through. Another way you can do it is by taking a big exacto knife, a long one, and just heating it up and burn your way through. That's another way of doing it. This way will be acceptable for now. We'll just gouge that out. Obviously try to hold a coping saw at a 90 degree angle. Now if the part is a little, if it's a sloppy fit, that's okay, but you don't want a press fit that, that's going to distort the foam. If it's a little sloppy, we'll just fill it in. Some soft balsa. We got alphatic resin. Just got some little sixteenth wedges holding them in place. Make sure you have a good alignment down the front of the wing. Make sure nothing's out of alignment, and we can go on to the other side. Obviously, this will have to sit aside and dry for a while, and we'll cut the hole out for the gear blocks. And gluing up the little pieces of gear block, which we'll cut off, of course finish these up. Gluing this with alphatic. I'm going to let this dry and I'll get all the angles and bevels and everything in and sink these down.
here, we're grinding that down. Take a block of 320 and just try to get it even. We don't want that sticking up through the sheeting. I've got the blocks pretty well molded in, pretty well flattened in, and I'm dusting off the whole core now, getting ready to shoot the core. Use 400 and a straight block and get the whole thing nice and flat. Then another important step is to blow it off with compressed air, vacuum it, get all that dust off. One of the reasons you have all the sheeting lifting problems is when you don't get the core itself totally clean of dust. Getting that sanding dust, and obviously you can't sheet over a cord, it isn't sanded out. So I'm just going to try to get this guy blocked out real nice. Make sure the blocks, your blocks are pa totally flat and parallel, you can't feel them sticking up or dropping down. I spent quite a bit of time getting this core blocked out real nice because obviously one of the things I don't want to see is seams and seams lifting and stuff like that. And this is how you get a good chance at getting a really top porous quality core. Get that core perfectly flat with 320 or 400. Vacuum it, blow the dust out before you make any attempt at sheeting it. You can see the way that foam just dusts right off. Try not to breathe too much of it in either. Not a good idea to breathe too much of it in. there to blow the dust off the core. Vacuum is a good idea too. Any way you can to get it immaculately clean before we sheet it. We only have to drop the gear blocks down and sheet it now and we're all set to go. This is just a standard air blower that goes on a compressor. Okay, we just cut out the little piece for the gear blocks. Dig out and clean out all the foam down there. Just matching that up so now I can go over to the saw and cut this off. I 
what I'm going to do is sand this one side down so I get a, a really tight fit. I really want a tight fit on this. I'm taking one hour epoxy and I'm just stiffening up the foam around these gear blocks a little bit, letting some of this sink in. Stiffen this area up a little bit. Make sure the top priority now is keep everything good and flat. Don't want to have anything sticking up above. Taking a little trowel and squeezing off some of the extra epoxy here. You want to keep this all perfectly level at any price. Now I put some balsa wood on the top of the gear block so I can get that balsa sanded right into position here. when you fly over grass a lot it's a it's a problem getting them gear blocks in solid this is a long list of planes that have bit in the dust because the gear blocks came out at least in our area of the country here yeah. all that's going to do is stiffen the foam up just a little bit before we actually put that piece this whole guy together here with the sheeting. And what I'll do now is to get a good bond on this. Put it with a little bit of a hair dryer. This is the little gear block. We've already sanded down the whole wing. I'll mix up some epoxy and do the same thing on this wing that we set on this one. These, these guys drop in and out real nice now. Just putting a little strengthening piece of fiberglass cloth around this too. This should get buried right underneath the wood. You won't even see this when it's done. Just strengthen this area up a little bit. I've seen a lot of ships where after you put them in the sun, those uh, those gear clips start to show through the sheeting. And I'd like, if I can, to keep that from happening.
And while we're waiting for that epoxy to dry on that glass cloth around the landing gear clips, we've still got a little time left tonight. I'm going to make up the flaps, try to get some of the sanding and carving done on the flaps. Well, that's trying. So we really have, we're in good shape. The tail is in silver. The wing is waiting for the glass cloth around the blocks to dry, and we're ready to start the flaps. And I've laid out, <coughs> laid out the flaps on a piece of uh, quarter inch, nice straight quarter inch. One of the things we're looking for in a flap, needless to say, is this piece of wood that's not going to warp and twist. Sea grain would be your first choice if you could get some. I don't have any. I'm going to be forced to use this. This looks like about a B grain piece. Sea grain would be better. Now it's important. When you cut this piece of wood out, let's say you're cutting it off of this big sheet, you don't want to have the, the hinge line be one of the edges. You want the edge of the flap to be an edge. So in other words, if we lay this out just like so, here's our mock-up now for our flap shape. The one thing we sure don't want is we don't want to have this piece of wood just butt up on a flap line and cut the hinge and cut the hinge line. Now I may not be making this clear, I don't know. We want to have the edge of the wood be the edge of the flap, the trailing edge. So when I cut the other flap, I want the trailing edge to be one of the edges of the wood. There's less chance than the grain is going, the grain should go parallel to this trailing edge, not to the hinge line. And that's really an important thing if you want to keep from putting trim tabs and tweaking flaps and stuff on your plane. So we'll lay this flap out. On this piece of wood, this is the second lightest piece of wood we have. And we want to have the, the edge of this piece of wood. Now I'm trying to see which side is the straightest. So now this will be the hinge line. The hinge line will be in the middle of the piece of wood, not out at the other end. Maybe that's an easy way to remember it. The hinge line should be in the middle of the wood, trailing edge on the edge of the wood. A lot less chance you'll warp it up that way. Before we even go on to the next step, I want to mirror image these up. Make sure they're exactly the same. Get a 90 degree edge here. Have my grain going parallel to the trailing edge. And get a nice center line on all that. I was doing both flaps at once to try and get a nice even edge on them. Step one. We have that nice sanding belt that's glued to a table. Just run them on air. At the same time, we're making sure that they're a good mirror image. You don't have one flap bigger than the other, or thicker, or in some way different. We can sight down them and see how we're doing. on this airplane is equal. Equal wings, equal span, equal flaps. 
So we got a good start on a mirror image flap. I've got some 320 taped down to the table. Just putting a final final finish on all these edges. We have basically got exact mirror images now. We can break these apart. Those flaps should be exactly equal. I'm just checking for 90 degrees on both of the flaps. Won't feel good at 90. The next thing I want to do is get the old center line on everything. <coughs> this is something you can practice on pieces of scrap wood till you get it where you feel comfortable doing this. And that is just holding your finger and the pen together and getting a center line right down the middle of everything. It's certainly accurate enough for what we're doing. the hinge line edge on. Pretty much the same as on a stab video. No sense redundant, making redundant for the footage here. Alright, now we're going to carve up, try to get the taper in it nice. side at a time. Put that nice taper in it. Sight down that edge. 
Sometimes if the wood is soft, you can use the plane, but this don't, this don't look like that kind of wood. Yeah. Just chunking up. That is already, Kenny already has another video of a, uh, another way to do flaps with, uh, music wire rods, and that'd be a nice one to get if you like to use that technique. I've used it, but I like just doing it by eye better. But it is a helpful way. In fact, I think it's the way <coughs> they show you on the Magnum plans to do it. It's a good way to, uh, to make a flap out of a solid piece of wood and get the paper right. Well, that's one side now. And we'll just repeat that on the other three sides. We sanded out the flaps there, just about ready for detail work, like the uh, horn supports and stuff. And we may get time to do a little work on the wing tonight. So. Obviously, we want to get these blocks level with the top of this. try to do when we try to sheet this wing 
what we're going to try to do is put epoxy here, mark out on the sheeting where that's going to reference off on the sheeting, put epoxy here and spray cement the rest of the wing and then roll it on. And what I'll do is I'll put one core away here. Now we got to start looking to make sure we got the right core and the right wing. And that's not the right one. Okay. This one lines up with this wing. Okay. Let's see if this guy lines up. Okay. That goes with that wing. So let's put one core away right now. Let's see how this is going to work out. Get a piece of sheeting. Now normally if we didn't have clips for the landing gear in here, well, of course we wouldn't have to go through all this aggravation. Now I have the sheeting marked, which is the glue side, of course. Okay. You definitely want to get all that dust blown off of there at any price now. Now is the time to start getting dust. All that dust is just going to keep the wing from... <coughs> okay, so we're going to glue this side first. Can't emphasize how important it is to get all the dust off of this wood when you're going to do the three end cement thing. These skins, of course, earlier on in the video, we sand it out. Now we want to definitely check. Put a little reference line up in the front. This is for our own reference. Because we're going to roll it, okay. Let's reference off the gear clips, exactly where the gear clips go. Okay. So that means roughly in this area here is where we're going to have epoxy. Okay. I'm going to mix up a little batch. Again, we're using that the glue where one tube is bigger than the other. just the epoxy. I'm going to get the 3M cement. I got the epoxy on the core already. Just make sure that they line up. Oh yeah, that's nice. Okay, and we'll just do the, the spray cement on this. Okay, I went out in the other room and sprayed the core the sheeting. Now we're just checking to see when this tacks up.
Give it about a minute or so to get tacky. Now we're only going to get one shot with this cork. Make sure the chorus, which has already been sprayed. As soon as you can pick that core up with the stickiness on your fingers, you know you got a good shot at getting it. Now remember, we got to line up. We got to get an exact alignment on this so we can reference into where we have fresh epoxy here. Roll down on the glass table. And roll away. and trim off the front of this so I can get some masking tape down by that area where the epoxy is. Obviously the part where the epoxy is, isn't going to stick like the part with the, uh, the 3M is going to grab instantly. So what we want to do is get the other half of this glued together and get some tape on this leading edge. Hold that together. I have sets for these sheeting, so... Now I'll do the same thing as get myself a reference line up in the front of the sheet. Plenty of sheeting up here. go through the same routine with the epoxy. Obviously try not to breathe in that 3M cement. Do that in a really well ventilated area. That stuff stinks. I don't know if it's carcinogenic, but it stinks and make you sick. Okay, I'm doing the same thing. Get a little bit of epoxy around these gear blocks up around here.
bit of a test fit here. Yeah, we're getting a real good bond on that. Okay. I'm going to go in the back and spray the cores. Shake up the cement. That's the test. When you can pick it up with your fingertips, that's the test. Okay, she's coming along nice now. Needless to say, make sure you have these core pieces in when you're pressing down. I noticed I don't have the front one in here because I was gouging out all that junk by the landing gears. And I can't put it back in because those clips are in the way, but I do have the other ones in there. Just thought I'd mention that. Okay. And it's getting sticky now. Repeat the same thing, line up the red line, line up the gear clips. And just roll that sheeting on that. It's hard keeping your fingertips free of the cement, I know that. Now I want to get right in there, get a longer knife. Right in there, and trim that front down. Okay, now we can look right from the top where we have all that epoxy setting up. Get a little bit of masking tape on there while the epoxy is setting. And we'll put this back right in the proper cradle. That is why we marked those cradles in the beginning of the construction. So now we know which is which. right down the back edge. Uh, now, I want to find one of the cradles, the one with double stripes, that's this one here. Now, once we get this lined up in a cradle, the way it should be, now we can put a real nice amount of pressure on it. Watch that sheeting down. Don't do it while it's on a flat table. Get it in the core. And 
and we want the matching core to this, which probably is outside when we get it. We get the matching core to this guy, which is the one with the double stripes. This one here. Wrong one. Okay, the stripes line up. Now we can flip it upside down, press down the back side. I like to give this about 5-10 minutes and I'll do most of it off camera of where I'm actually just babysitting this, pressing it down, leave it in the cradle, press it down. Especially on the area that has the epoxy and we want to get a good bond on that. We'll still hit that with a hand dryer too just to make sure. now for a little while. Line it back up. We'll put this in the cradle. Now see how why it's important to do those those marks on there. We can line them marks back up. put him back in a cradle overnight, put some weight on it. I'll do the other one off camera and we're all set. In the morning we'll sand that sheeting out, let it sit in the core overnight. we did last night, came down after the football game and got the leading and trailing edges on this so they could dry and I could work on it today. I got it sitting up here with the leading and trailing edges glued on with alphatic. That'll have to dry now for a while and uh, while it's drying we're going to go out flying. Uh, it's a nice day out there and John's coming over for a day of flying so uh, this will dry up. Obviously the next step is to get a uh, a leading and trailing edge shaped and get these guys block sanded into halves. These are just some custom handles we're making up for uh, This has been sitting for a couple days now. It's actually been sitting over the weekend. We'll get the tape off of here. Carve and sand the leading and trailing edges. Get some center lines on it. Get the control system put in.
one of the first things we got to do is poke a pin in here and find a hole for the landing gear wire and then gouge out that trough, which is what I'm going to do right now. I just got that started. This is the one from the other side. Stick a little pin hole in there and find the landing gear slot. Here's our little slot for the landing gear wire now. Got that in. The way we reference that is by sticking a pin in, you can look inside the wing and find a pin, drop a pin hole in, measure it in this way, and drop a pin hole down for the wire. And you can see when you drop a pin in, you can see it come out the bottom of the gear block. Just stiffening up the wood edges with uh, a little bit of CA now. Get a nice edge there, strengthen it up a little bit. We have a nice slot for a wire. That down, we're gonna have to make a little a little set screw operation here that can hold this down so we made a little clearance hole because that wire is going to be moving back and forth. We don't want to chew up the balsa wood here. I just made up a little metal cover and I'll cover this with balsa wood so this can blend right in. I'm just making the screw alignment right now. Dremel this out with the Dremel. Just have a little piece. The screw goes in. Made up a little plywood template so that the other side can be the same. Put a little balsa wood cap on there, countersunk the screw so it's flush. That'll be our little door. <coughs> I got the wrong screwdriver here. This There's a little cap, it's metal on the bottom, 30 thousandths soft aluminum. Kind of sink the little screw in so it's flush. And a little pocket, which we milled out with the Dremel tool. And just bolt the hatch in place and block sand it nice and flush. We got plenty of clearance for the landing gear that it's going to, leaving this hole oversized is a good idea because you never know if you're going to hit a little stone or something bend that landing gear up. And this way you don't chew up the wing as you do it. Block sand it all nice and flush. There's our little landing gear. I think it looks a lot nicer than when you just run the wire on the top of the wing and put screws and stuff in it. This adds a little bit of a, a nice look to it. And 
The easiest way to get this done is make the little metal plate first, trace it out onto the sheeted wing, and take the Dremel tool and just Dremel down into it. The bit we're using as a flat body. Hollowed that out down to the block. Let's see if you can see this. And we'll make another little block up now for that side. This piece, of course, is going to fit right in here. Famous last words. We got to drill it out a little more. All I do is just hot stuff that aluminum piece to a piece of wood. Making the hatch. Leave it a little bit oversized. Now I can trim it right down to shape. When you get most of it hogged off, just take it over to the belt sander. Or you can belt block sand it by hand here. Sand right up flush to the aluminum. And we'll have the hatch made in a matter of a uh, few minutes. And there we have the hatch with a piece of wood glued to it. Now we'll just drill this back, bolt it in place, and carve it to shape. 